And so that pretty much uh, concludes our discussion about how people do association studies for uh, binary phenotypes. So we'll spend the rest of the lecture talking about basically association studies for continuous phenotypes. So these are phenotypes like height or uh, BMI or things like this. Um, in practice, you'll tend to find that association analysis methods, at least for association studies of unrelated individuals, um, the, the methodologies used for continuous phenotypes are much better developed in general than those for binary phenotypes, uh, in part because you'll see that it's much easier to correct for confounding uh, variables like population structure or family relatedness uh, when you use models meant for continuous phenotypes. And so what you also see in practice is that even for a lot of discrete traits, uh, like disease instance of type 2 diabetes versus controls, um, oftentimes people actually still use the methods that uh, are meant for continuous phenotypes, mainly because they are uh, much more flexible in terms of what they can correct for. And actually, it turns out that uh, even though it mathematically doesn't really make sense, if you just kind of encode, say, for example, cases as a phenotype of one and controls as a value of zero, then these continuous phenotype methods seem to actually work quite well, even for discrete traits. And so the basic idea of an association study for uh, continuous traits is that at least for humans, for example, most humans are uh, diploid. And so obviously uh, for each given SNP in the human genome, for example, we generally, most SNPs are biallelic. And so <clears throat> uh, for any given position uh, of a SNP in the human genome, you should see uh, at most two different alleles. And so here's an example where columns represent uh, different SNPs and rows represent different chromosomes uh, for two different individuals. And so in an association study for continuous phenotypes, the idea is that for each SNP in the genome, you need to convert somebody's uh, SNPs into an actual number, right? And so the idea here is that uh, across a population of individuals for a given column or for a given SNP, you can basically choose, because most SNPs that you're going to be looking at are biallelic, you can basically pick one allele as the so-called reference allele and the other allele as the so-called alternative allele. And in this case, you can, for example, just count for each individual and each SNP position, you can just count the number of reference alleles that you see at that position. And so because human genomes are generally diploid, um, each SNP gets converted into a zero, one, or two depending on how many reference alleles you count. And say, so for example, for the individual in the top, uh, for the leftmost SNP, you can see that the reference allele chosen for that position was uh, adenine. And so because the first individual only has one adenine, then uh, his SNP at that position is encoded as a one. So here's the general idea of an association study with continuous phenotypes. So suppose that you have, you're looking at a population of N individuals. So say like, you know, 20 individuals. The idea is that for every individual in your study, you can both presumably measure the phenotype you're interested in. So in this case, BMI. And for that same individual, for a single SNP, you can quantify for that SNP, whether a given individual is either zero, one, or two, depending on uh, what, uh, depending on how many reference alleles that you found at that position for uh, their genome. And then what you can do is because you have, in this case, say for example, 20 points corresponding to 20 individuals, you can just plot a scatter plot where the x-axis is a genotype uh, of an individual at that position and the y-axis is just the continuous phenotype you're interested in. And you can basically fit a line to the scatter plot that you draw here. And so the general idea is that no matter what SNP or phenotype you're looking at, there's kind of three basic patterns you can, uh, that you can see in these kind of plots. So in the case where 
for example, for BMI, suppose you drew the scatter plot and you fit a line of best fit. If the slope of that line is positive, so what that means is that uh, the line is, is, that basically means that the phenotype is increasing with every addition of the reference allele, then in this case, you can uh, tentatively conclude that the reference allele is a risk allele because what this what a straight line in this specific case means is it means that uh, for every addition of a reference allele to an individual genome there's a fixed increase in BMI uh, that's what this line in particular means and so because you're because as you add more reference alleles to an individual, you generally see higher BMI, then in this case, the T allele would be considered a risk allele because the more Ts you have, the higher your BMI is. Similarly, if the scatter plot you drew has a negative slope, and so with every additional reference allele, your BMI uh, on average seems to decrease, then you might tentatively conclude that the T allele is actually protective in the sense that with every additional reference allele that you have for an individual, you seem to notice that BMI decreases with the number of T alleles. And the most common case is where you get something that looks approximately like a flat line, um, like shown here on the right hand side of the slide. And in the case where you have a flat line as a line of best fit or something that looks close to flat, then this essentially tells you that there's no significant, no statistically significant association between the reference allele and your phenotype of interest. And so in this case, the slope of the line is effectively zero. Uh, flat line essentially means a, a slope of zero. So two important concepts that you need to know about for association testing are effect size and statistical significance. So these two concepts should be getting to be very familiar for you at this point. But in this case, effect size, generally speaking, refers to the average change in phenotype per reference allele uh, that you estimate when you fit your line. And so large effect size is shown on the left, where, for example, in this hypothetical case with BMI, you see an average change of BMI of 10 units per reference allele, which would be huge if, if this was actually like a real SNP. Uh, on the other hand, a small, an example of a small effect size SNP would be one in which there's barely any change in BMI for every uh, addition of a reference allele. And so this would be much more typical of, of obesity. And so it's worth pointing out that uh, in this lecture, Oftentimes, we're going to use a, the proper form of an equation to illustrate or to describe a line of best fit. And so the stereotypical way to represent a line is to write it down in the form y equals mx plus b. Or in this case, what I'm writing it as is the phenotype on the left, BMI, is equal to uh, beta, which, I'll typically, which is the symbol I'll typically use to represent the effect size times the uh, basically the x-axis variable, which is represented by the SNP. And usually there's actually an intercept term, um, which sometimes I'll call beta zero, uh, which just refers to the y-intercept uh, of your line of best fit. But I'm just excluding it here uh, for now, just for simplicity's sake. And so again, the, the other concept is statistical significance. So in this case, specifically for line fitting, uh, statistical significance is also termed uh, goodness of fit. And so the idea here is that when you fit a line to your scatter plot, it's possible to fit a line to any set of points, uh, whether or not the line actually explains the data well or fits the points well is another issue. And so consider the two figures here on the bottom left and right, where uh, I basically fit a line of best fit through the scatter points in each case. But you should be able to see that in terms of the figure on the left, 
The scatter points sit fairly close to the line of best fit. And so the line of best fit actually fits the data pretty well because intuitively the blue points are all close to the black line. And so that's in contrast to the figure on the right where it's true that you can generally see a increase in, for example, BMI with addition of different reference numbers of reference alleles. But you can see that there's pretty wide scatter between the blue points and the black line. And so intuitively, uh, the figure on the right on the right represents relatively poor fit, and the figure on the left represents relatively good fit. And so how fit how goodness of fit is actually quantified uh, typically when you're talking about lines of best fit is it's typically quantified in terms of this squared error, right? And so more specifically, uh, lines of best fit are typically calculated using what's called the least scores method. In that case, in those cases, um, what how the line is fit is intuitively uh, you look at many possible lines and you're essentially picking the line that minimizes the squared difference between each blue point and the corresponding uh, point on the black line. So that's referred to as squared error. And so when that squared error is low, uh, that tends to correspond to figures like the one on the left. And when that number is big, it tends to correspond to the uh, figure on the right.